India, land of a billion people, a vast and ancient civilization, and once the jewel in the crown of the biggest empire the world had ever seen. Look at all this pomp and show. This is really fancy. Many of the films from the era are long gone, but in the vaults of the British Film Institute, 300 reels survive. Now carefully restored and shown to a contemporary audience for the very first time. It's extraordinary watching these archive films because one's so used to seeing the stills, but footage is far rarer. The glory of empire was there on their screens. The films are an astonishing window into a vanished world, capturing the very height of British power and wealth and India's fight for independence. What were those people thinking? What was going through their mind when they were creating history? Why are we being shown what we are being shown? Why are we told this is the real India as opposed to that? You do feel like you're watching life in a way that isn't often captured in film. It is as if these people from another era are looking at you. There is that feeling of being haunted by them almost. Together, these images tell the remarkable story of India on film. This is Banaras, on the banks of the river Ganges, the spiritual home of India. An ancient city said to be 3,000 years old. It is also the first place in India ever to be captured on film. This footage is from 1899. Wow, this is Banaras. That's my hometown. In fact, I learned my swimming there, you know. My father just threw me in the river and I had to really swim back, you know, and that's how I learned my swimming. Well, it's quite wonderful to see this slow, long take of the ghats in Banaras. These are the steps leading down from the city to the river, and of course, this is really the heart of the city of Benares. It's where all the religious rituals take place. Every locality has its own ghats. There are still people whose families, like 50 years ago, 100 years ago, would, would come at 4 o'clock in the morning, have their bath, and then start the day. It's like a lifeline of the people of the city of Benares. The British Film Institute's archive of early films of India is the largest in the world, and extremely rare. 300 highly flammable reels preserved in climate-controlled vaults. Now cleaned and digitized, it's a new window on a lost world. This is India seen through colonial eyes. In particular, European filmmakers were drawn to places like Banaras, returning time and again to capture its temples, devotees, and cremation sites. Wherever somebody in a Hindu family dies, they bring him to Banaras for the last rites. And that is what really fascinated the British when they came here. And they saw all these busy people dealing with these kind of things and taking it as a casual day-to-day -day matter. Even today, it is the dream of every Hindu to pass away in Banaras. So when a person dies, you get a little bit of Ganges water and you put it in their mouth. Because you can't always be by the Ganges. Early European filmmakers also ventured into other cities to capture scenes of everyday life. This 1906 film by the Walter Door Company is simply titled A Native Street in India. I love the way in which everyone's walking down the road and just looking at this camera and thinking, you know, what is this? The camera is static. It's in the middle of the street, allowing life to pass by. 
people almost run out of the crowd to sort of really face down this, this machine that is in front of them. And they have no fear of that. It's just what's going on here. They're, you know, nat naturally curious, as, as you would be. And this is a period where India is very divided. The British Raj has its, pla has its places of residence away from the native market. They wouldn't have shopped in these streets. It's a divided society very much this time in all sorts of ways, class, race, and through and through. Above all, India was divided by caste, a rigid hereditary system that shaped all aspects of life. In some parts of India, you know, low caste people had no access to the roads. To be able to walk on the roads, you had to belong to a certain caste. It's interesting that there's no caste-based distance keeping here because you can see some people are visibly of upper caste. They've got their umbrellas and their, you know, they're wearing tunics and shirts, which means you're part of the new educated elite. You're not necessarily your usual uneducated country type. But there are other people who are, you know, going about their business shirtless and somehow they all exist on the same street and they're not really keeping too much of a distance from each other. That's quite fascinating. You can see this woman here who wears this sari and there is no blouse inside the sari. She's a Bengali woman. Even today, you will find people in parts of Bengal dressed up like that. But it was British influence that brought in the blouses and the wearing of the blouses. If you're part of a new, upwardly mobile class that's starting to work, starting to get exposed to Western ideas, then your women start wearing blouses. Otherwise, they just sort of drape the sari without the blouse. I actually found this a really amazing film to watch. You do feel like you're watching ordinary life in a way that isn't often captured in film in this very in early period. For 300 years, Britain controlled much of the subcontinent in what's known as British India. The parts in yellow show areas governed directly by the crown from Calcutta. The sections in pink were ruled by Indian princes, but only in name. In these lands, the British wielded extensive influence. The British were far ahead of any other European power. This was really the high point, if you like, of Victorian Britain and its empire. Today, Coronation Park is a dusty, forgotten corner of Delhi, a playground for local children. But in 1902, it was the site of grand imperial might. This was the Great Darbar a ceremonial court modeled on that of earlier Mughal rulers. In this case, to celebrate the coronation of King Edward VII. Cameras from the Gaumont Company capture the moment the Indian princes, or Maharajas, make their spectacular entrance. What fascinates me is how the British adopted all these Mughal systems, you know. They never had a darbar in Britain. It shows how the British were perfectly willing to adopt Indian customs and traditions in order to enhance their own power. The British you know, thought that Indians like a bit of pageantry and, 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 and a bit of glitter, but of course it also satisfied the British need for pageantry and glitter. This is a mock parade of created rulers. The term Maharaja itself is really a, a British invention. There were a whole range of different rulers with different titles. They had nothing in common, but the British created a sort of uh, 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 an artificial um, formal status called Maharaja. That sort of uh, status was much fought for. It was also a way of ensuring their loyalty by keeping them in competition with one another. When I see a film of the Darbar, I see it as an act enactment of a circus, really. I've met Maharajas who said my grandfather was very important because he sat on the right of the commander-in-chief. Of what importance is that really? But it made them feel very special. Now weather-beaten statues that litter the old Darbar site, the viceroys immortalized here were once all-powerful representatives of the crown. None more so than George Nathaniel Curzon. It was he who orchestrated the 1902 Darbar. 
George Nathaniel Curzon was the most superior person, was the line they used to shout after him at Eton. This was him absolutely living every fantasy ever had of being the most superior person in the world. And it was supposed to be his vision of India lining up in front of him, these well-behaved Indian rulers in their wonderful robes and silks. You know, it's a new century. They're all there to some, somehow inaugurate a new era in the story of the country. A celebration to impress the king. But the king, Edward VII, wasn't there. Instead, he sends his brother, the Duke of Connaught, to the disappointment of Lord Curzon. In this film, we see the Duke arriving at the Darbar. This is British military tradition marrying Indian military costumes. So they've got these turbans, but they are riding horses. Wearing of a turban, wearing of anything on the head, it's a bit like wearing a hat. It's both formal wear, but it's also an indication of prestige. And the more elaborate the turban is, the more wealth you have, the more uh, status in society you have. And of course, it ends up with the crown, which is the most, the finest of turban you can get. Films of the Darbar were shown not just in Britain, but all around the globe. Even in this early age of film, its power as propaganda was clearly understood. The glory of empire was there on their screens for every common man, woman, and child around the world to see. And the elephant, so alien to the common Britisher, who's probably never seen an elephant except perhaps in a, in a zoo. But to see them sort of, you know, in the streets is very much part of this exotic East. It's extraordinary footage, and it's said that the footage of the Durbar was the thing that originally encouraged film in India, and that the early Indian film industry followed on from the incredible popularity of the moving pictures put up in village after village, town after town, across India, after this sort of clip was shown to the people of India for the very first time. It actually is an incredibly important piece of footage because out of this comes Bollywood and everything else. Kolkata, West Bengal, home to 15 million people, one of the biggest, busiest cities in India and once the seat of British rule. This remarkable footage shows Kolkata in 1906. The cameraman's choice to shoot from a moving vehicle takes us right into the action. There's a general sense of disorder, and within that disorder, there's an order, you know? Nobody runs over anybody. You don't bump into anybody in an Indian street. And yet, when you see them, you say, God, they're going to run into each other, and you see cars or carriages just getting st street, and the last minute, they swerve. It's great to see these shots of the streets of Calcutta, crowded, but looking far emptier than they would look today. Calcutta, like uh, most British Indian cities, was divided between the British half and the Indian part of the city. And these clips show the wealthier and commercial part of the Indian city, where Indian commerce, Indian business establishments, Indian trade was conducted, and where the British wouldn't venture very often. So actually, you don't see any British on the street here in this particular scene. If you go to certain parts of Calcutta, like those handcarts and people wearing those that attire, like that, that that is still followed here. That's why I liked it. I really liked it. Like it's still present. Even now, it's still present. Some part of it. The British architecture is still like very much prominent in Calcutta as far compared to other cities as well. Like it has a heritage kind of vibe here. I call it the vintage city. It's still living in old times. Today, buildings like the Victoria Memorial are a reminder of Kolkata's colonial past. Uh, Calcutta was meant to compete with the Mughal capital of Delhi. 
its monuments are spectacular. No other British Indian city can match up to Kolkata in terms of its monumental character. Calcutta at the time was a very glamorous place, you know, so it was the seat of empire, it was the seat of Indian modernity in some ways. A, a good chunk of the nationalistic impulse was born in Calcutta because this is where educated Indians were in contact with the English and democratic ideas were slowly emerging in their minds. India was the crown jewel of the British Empire and a vital source of its wealth. Much of it built on Calcutta's port and on the back of Indian labour. We now see the shores of the Hooghly River, then, as now, a hub of activity. Calcutta was a great port city. It was the destination for all the produce of the tea gardens of northern India and Assam and Darjeeling. And it was also the port from which much of India's agricultural products like indigo and, and jute were exported. Now we see some of the river boats. These are very interesting to see the kind of river craft that Indians used. They're wooden boats with high hulls and then lots of low river craft which were used for transporting people and goods. You get a real sense of the labor, digging, carrying, pushing, and you see how the comforts of the empire that the British enjoyed, mostly back home, but also in India, of course, were built on this massive labor that Indians provided. And then you see in the background there the hull of a great British steamship. Of course, that revolutionized connections between Britain and India when they were introduced uh, in the last decades of the 19th century. The expansion of global shipping fueled other industries at Calcutta's bustling port. One of them was the making of marine cables from the fibers of the hemp plant, a laborious process seen for the first time on film in this footage from 1909. Hemp was very, very important to the economy because it was one such fiber which could be used a lot for marine purposes, for cables, sacks, bags, packaging materials. Even in those days, it wasn't just done by hand. They had these machines. I think it's amazing in those days to be able to film it. Some scenes in this are absolutely beautifully framed and shot. There's real thought that has gone into the lighting of the scenes, to the way that the people have situated in it. The movement across the materials themselves. At last, we see the marine cable. A rope so formidable, it looks like it could crush these men if they are not careful. The workers heave the cable onto a waiting barge. Job finally done, it's time for a break. We imagine that a hundred years ago in India, people would have taken a break as many do now, with a strong cup of tea. Tea is so closely bound with our image of India, it may surprise you to know that it's not a native drink. We won't get anyone drinking a cup of tea until about, I don't know, ordinary Indians wouldn't have seen head or tail of it much before 1850. And it wouldn't have become a general thing, I imagine, until the early 20th century. Indians were soon addicted to tea, as were the British. By 1935, tea was a major industry, and scenes of its plantations were a staple of imperial travelogues to introduce India to a global audience. These, like many other young things, spend the first year of their lives in a nursery. I love this accent. In a nursery. Plantations. Plantations. The plants are fenced in for protection against prowling jungle animals. And they're also sheltered from the fierce heat of the sun. Five years of close and careful attention must be bestowed upon the young plants. The accents sound like something from ancient history, but if you go up to Assam, you see the tea picking in exactly the same way. You could literally take the same shot today with the same women wearing the same saris, the same production methods. But the only thing that's dated is the fantastic pre-war British accents. The leaves, green now of course, are weighed and taken in bullock carts to the factory, 
You see here the tea going from being picked to being dried. Young children are doing the labor there, young boys, and then to being sorted by a machine, and then finally packaged into the tea chests, which would take the tea uh, to Britain and across the world. Much of the labor for this tea production was brought in from the plains, often in pretty unpleasant circumstances, the use of effectively indentured labor on the tea estates. But the painful realities of imperial trade were often ignored in these travelogues. What they served up instead is a rosy view of plantation life. In this next film, the hilltop plantation is practically a vacation spot. The tea growing parts of India came to look like little England because they were often in hilly land. The British there really created a kind of doll's house version of their image of England. As an example of curves and loops and spirals, the Darjeeling Railway takes a good deal of beating. I'm absolutely certain this is part of the sort of almost toy railways that were built to transport primarily British officials up to the hill stations established under the Raj. These mountain railways are part of a vast network first built in the 1830s to move goods and soldiers and maintain order. The best known of the railways is the train that originally ran between Siliguri and Darjeeling, designed by one Sir Franklin Prestige. It was planned and built by an imaginative and persistent man who, in spite of the general belief that the thing couldn't be done, proved that it could. People said it's impossible to make a train here, but you have to remember they were the greatest power of that time. You wanted 100 men, you wanted 1,000 men, you wanted 10,000 men. It was all possible. It's a wonderful combination of the mind and the brain and the brawn. The track that he laid so ingeniously clings to steep mountain sides and precipices. There are interesting sights of quite another character to be seen on this remarkable trip. You can see that there's this man running with the flag in front. You see, that's the way of warning people that the train is coming. So the man is running faster than the train because he's clearly beating the train. The way the people are interacting, this is quite an event. When people saw this wonderful machine coming, steaming away, it was almost like a new god. So the same thing when the train comes, you know, they say, what is this? By the time this film was made in 1934, India had one of the largest railway networks in the world. Once built to enable colonial trade and control, the railways are now part of everyday life. I think it's wrong to only see the railways as this beacon of Western imperial exploitation. It's undeniable that it played a great part in welding India together by the time the British left. The railways are one of the many complicated legacies of colonial rule. Another is religion. The Salvation Army arrived in India in 1882 and often documented its missionary work to screen at fundraisers in Britain. Their whole project was conversion to Christianity. The people that they sort of targeted were usually the lower castes and the untouchables. There was this idea that the Salvation Army will now civilize them, make them citizens worthy of the empire. This is interesting because this is the, one of the few moments that these films actually touch upon the issue of caste. The Salvation Army instilled military-like discipline among their converts, proudly on display in this 1904 film. Is that a woman on a horse? An unusual sight in India. And children in uniform, so they're assuming they're from a mission school somewhere, looking very happy. Missionaries often provided access to education and medical care, giving the lowest classes a quality of life denied to them by their caste. The low caste groups in India, their relationship with the experience of colonialism and missionaries is very different. 
because they don't necessarily see it as pure evil. It was the upper castes who saw missionaries as people who came to assault their religion, whereas low castes said, no, they've come to liberate us. So we finally have a personality. We can finally go to school. Earlier, we had to wear degrading clothes or barely any clothes at all. Now we've got neat uniforms and it gives us a sense of dignity. The British were drawn to India not simply for trade. For early filmmakers, this was a magical world of beauty and intrigue. To their eyes, everything seemed new and unfamiliar. No, it's fascinating, it's fascinating because, you know, th this is part of that Orientalism which they wanted to capture. But uh, that which was picturesque in the 19th century is still picturesque in the 21st. By the early 1900s, we start to see experiments with color. One example is from 1909, filmed in northern India. It's called Delhi, Great Capital of India, a reference to the city's history as the seat of the old Mughal Empire. German intertitles testify to its international reach. The film shows a Muslim procession in the heart of the old city. You can see acrobats and jugglers and all kinds of people. It was kind of festival-like atmosphere, you know, scene of celebration. This was also a kind of site of mourning. And here you see a kind of commemoration of the martyrdom of the Prophet Muhammad's grandson, Imam Hussein, which is commemorated every year largely by Shiite Muslims, but also by many others. And the interesting thing about these Indian commemorations is that everyone seemed to join in, Hindus and Muslims and others. And you can see that you have models of the tombs of Imams Hussein and Hassan, but you also have these rather fanciful models that look more like Hindu temples than they do Muslim monuments. And those might be indeed Hindu temples. Processions like these would take place all over India during the first month of the Islamic calendar. The highlight was the reenactment of the fierce battle in which Imam Hussein was killed. His death is one of the most significant events in Shia history. The riot of colors, the noise. I'm sure the cameramen were very skilled, but more than that, I think the performers were much more skilled that they could without sound, without color, they could still convey the same feeling as you do when you're watching a color film. Sometimes they took these processions via Hindu temples, and sometimes they would be a kind of face-off between members of the different religions, which could then very often escalate into religious riots. And in fact, the British were very worried often by these Muharram processions because they thought they could be sparks to, to social uh, unrest. Um, so they always kept a close eye. You have the Darugas, the native police, as well as the foreign police trying to control the crowds. The cameraman from Pathé Brothers has found the perfect spot to film the action, though he too becomes part of the spectacle. There's a lot of look towards the camera. In that sense, the camera is almost like a protagonist in this scene where you know that the camera is placed over there because of the look. It is as if these people from another era or another century, you know, are looking at you, I mean, from beyond time. I mean, there is that, that feeling of being haunted by them almost. The next scene of the film takes us to the Jama Masjid, the Great Mosque of Delhi. Built in 1656 by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan, it is known for its exterior of red sandstone and white marble. But that's not what early film colorists chose to highlight. 
There's a very curious coloring of the figures here with a pale yellow color, and then also of parts of the mosque too, the verses from the Quran, which are uh, chiseled into the panels of the building. It's almost as if they're practicing or trying out stenciling here. They haven't quite got the confidence to stencil everything in in color. It's fascinating, you know, because it's a technology from where we have come so far, you know that to look back and say this is how color movies be began, it's absolutely fascinating. In the hundred years since this film was made, little seems to have changed at Jama Masjid. It is a mosque that remains the central mosque in India today. And I have myself seen, even in such a largely Muslim space, others coming at times of prayer to perform their own religious ceremonies. It is fairly unique, I think, to India, actually. A remnant, if you will, but a very significant remnant of a shared culture to this day, more than 70 years after the partition of India. Religion was not the only subject that intrigued early European filmmakers. They were also charmed by fruit. This catalogue was made for the French science programme Scientia in 1914, though English title cards suggest it was also screened in Britain. The images captivate audiences even today. There's an element of desire and sort of and fetishism around this film. It's not grand political figures or aspects of state. It's not about the army. It's about this hot country where people are eating exotic food and enjoying it. I think there's a degree of pleasure in this film that isn't present in some of the other films. There's a, a dreamlike quality to this film. It is both so kind of tactile and draws you in, and it must have been so different for, for people watching it in Britain. Bunches of bananas, ordinary to us today, but obviously exciting for someone in 1914 with the First World War raging and probably no bananas getting through. You hear reports of bananas arriving after the Second World War when rationing is over, and it's a huge treat. What's interesting is that no one would make a film about bananas today, would they? Because, you know, I could just go down to the shop and they're there. Uh, it's interesting, an interesting reminder of how more provincial Europe would have been at that time. Many of the reels of India in the vaults of the British Film Institute show scenes from British-held territories. And now and then, filmmakers ventured into other colonial settlements to capture their exotic sites. This 1914 travelogue is called Vilnur and is set in the French colony of Pondicherry in South India. And here you have the famous Puspus, the Push Push. The Pus Pus locates it as a kind of French colonial territory, but in British India, you had pulled rickshaws. That was pulled from the front, this is pulled from the back, so you don't even have to see the people who are working for you. That must have been a marker for a real difference of French imperialism for a British audience. A wealthy European family goes on a tour of Pondicherry. They end their visit at a Hindu temple, where they are treated to a dance. The performance is described as a notch, a popular entertainment passed down from Mughal times. But these are, in fact, Devdasi dancers. Dev means God and Dasi means servant of God. Calling these girls as notch girls, I find very, very disturbing. But the Europeans couldn't really understand the intricacies of classical Indian dance or the spirituality that was connected to it. They brought all Indian classical dances to the level of as if they were dances performed by prostitutes. It's more about a certain judgment against French rule than it is about India, I think. I think they're meant to be French people, right? Because they're visiting this and they're taking in the sights and they're attending a notch and they're consuming narcotics, a betel nut and a rock leaf. This is not something that the British were meant to do, but the French would do it. Seen today, 
the temple dancers draw a very different response. If you look at the saris that they're wearing, you can actually almost feel that texture, right? It's like a, you can feel that silk, the texture of the silk sari that they're wearing, you know, and beautiful colors. And, and especially this one, I really, really, really like this image. She is not intimidated by the camera. She's looking, you know, across that time and looking at us. And for that reason alone, this one frame, I would just freeze it, you know, because it's just so beautiful. The year this film was made, 1914, Britain and the rest of Europe was about to go to war. This great war would change everything for the British Empire and for India. Twelfth December, nineteen eleven, Delhi. A darbar to mark the coronation of King George V. A monumental expression of empire, involving hundreds of thousands of troops and spectators. We see the Viceroy of India, Lord Harding, leading the procession. And finally, the main event. This is the first time that a reigning monarch has ever gone to India. But I think one of the interesting things about 1911 was how perfectly staged managed it was. You have to understand why were these events being filmed, who the primary audience for these events were. The whole event is about symbolically linking the British monarchy, the might, the prestige with the British Empire. And for that symbolism to work, foreign audiences, particularly those at home, needed to see a respectful, loyal India. No effort was spared to ensure these images of the Delhi Darbar reached all corners of the globe. Several film companies were present, giving us an unusually detailed record. So what the film companies do is not only do they rush their films back for almost immediate, distribution, they also reissue films of previous Durbars. So, you know, all of the world has Durbar mania thanks to these films. We see a procession of elderly British and Indian soldiers, veterans who had fought for the crown in the mutiny of 1857. There was an uprising that spread across North India. The whole of the East India Company's own uh, sepoy infantry revolted and the British very nearly lost India. And in response to that, they wiped out certainly hundreds of thousands of people. The response to the 1857 uprising is the most brutal thing that the British ever do in India. The British retaliation was aided by these soldiers, many of them Sikhs and Gurkhas. A lot of these veterans would have been very young men when they fought for the British and they have medals on their coats which they proudly display. Every time the British have a Durba in India, Indian war veterans are always brought out because they represent loyal India. And by implication, they suggest that British rule is popular. The British called the events of 1857 a mutiny. For many Indians, it was the first war of independence. By 1911, control by the crown was starting to slip. At the Darbar, King George V announces the shifting of the capital from Calcutta to Delhi. By that time, Calcutta had become a hotbed of nationalist activism, making it unsafe for the British. 
by now there were many internal critiques of empire that some voices are beginning to ask questions like why are we there it's not our country why are we there what is empire what is this empire one could see the seeds of discontent see this person who's been identified as the gay god of baroda he just walks away he does not bow and then he shows his back to the king and queen which he is not supposed to do and this became the big selling point of the film and it was used to sort of generate interest around the film and you know the the advertisements for the film would say go see the gay quad bob thanks to the presence of multiple film companies we have the moment captured from different angles So there's this controversial event at this Durbar with the gay choir who has supposedly snubbed the king. But when the films were shown there was this talk like was this actually the right person here? And then there are also other people apparently in this footage who just show their back and go. So we don't know if that controversy was a real one or whether it was created to generate some kind of interest or buzz around the film. It was media gossip. in the UK but when this film was shown in India it was edited out it was considered you know we really shouldn't show show this we've got to show just the people who are uh, paying obedience in the right manner by not performing the role he's meant to perform it casts then the indian as a problematic uh, subject that can't be trusted the idea that we have certain peoples in india who have for generations been empire loyalists that certainty was slipping their children their grandchildren were no longer quite as trustworthy as they once were whatever their doubts about loyalty once the first world war breaks out the british turn to india for troops this 2 minute news reel dated october 1914 shows indian soldiers departing for what is now tanzania to fight the germans many of those we see here are six Rajputs and Pathans whom the British thought of as natural warriors the racism is already built into the statement the dusky allies it was always a volunteer army it was never a conscript army in part because the british were afraid of forcibly recruiting people who might then mutiny indian troops were always equipped in a less technologically advanced way compared to their european counterparts and the indian army was always shadowed by a european british army uh, in case it needed to be disarmed 1.3 million indians fought for the british in africa and europe during the war in the same gomont newsreel there is a clip showing a scottish regiment on parade viewed together the two films make for a telling comparison part of the hope was that by supporting britain in the war india would be rewarded by greater freedoms that didn't come then in 1919 a year after the end you had the notorious massacre at amritsar hundreds of unarmed indians were killed by british troops at the holy city of amritsar an act that spurred demands for full independence and that was really a turning point when indian loyalty for the empire basically evaporated in the years to come the story of india and its people would unfold in dramatic unexpected ways